to talk about is an overview of zeros of a polynomial. And there's a couple things I just want to kind of explain. I'm not going to go through the formal definition. Um, you guys can find this in your book. But I just want to kind of overview a little bit, kind of just talk about um, some of these definitions up here and why they're going to be important as far as finding the zeros. Now, I will honestly say, in this day and age, your graphing calculator is going to be essential to helping you out finding the zeros of a function um, and you know being able to identify what your function is doing. So. First of all, though, the zeros, remember, are you know, kind of the same thing as your roots, and they're there where the graph crosses the x-axis. Now, usually when you just get to, you know, when you're dealing with quadratics, it's fairly simple. We can do quadratic formula, we can do factoring, complete the square, we can find out those roots. But once we get to problems that are a little bit more difficult, um, for instance, let's say I have f of x, and let's do uh, 2x cubed. plus 3x squared minus 8x plus 3, I believe. Yeah, let's try this one. Okay, so there's a lot of things going on with this one. This one's a little bit more difficult um, you know, to see exactly what the graph is. Now, graph calculator is going to be very powerful in helping you out. Um, but what I want to do is I want to go through kind of some old school kind of stuff and just tell you what, um, what we can do to kind of help us understand what the zeros are going to be doing for this function. First thing is we have the rational... No. First thing I'm going to talk about is the fundamental theorem of algebra. And what the fundamental theorem of algebra is telling us is, pretty much in layman's term, is that for every polynomial that has a degree greater than one, so that means you know, it's a polynomial, there's at least one factor in the complex number system. So since we've, we've learned about complex numbers, and what we've figured out now, there's at least one factor. All right? There could be more, but there's at least one factor for all polynomials. Remember, you know, when you have a degree that is, that is one, obviously, because if it was zero, then it would just always equal one. So whenever you have a polynomial, there's going to be at least one factor. And, um, and therefore, we'll just leave it at that. Then the next thing is the linear factorization theorem. And what that states is the most amount of factors you can have of a polynomial is your leading, is your degree of your polynomial. So what that's saying is if I look at this, if I'm looking at this um, polynomial right here, by the linear factorization theorem, I know there is at most no more than three factors. Now they can be real, they can be imaginary, complex, but there's no more than three. Now there has to be at least one by the fundamental theorem of algebra and at most three, all right? So that's kind of some really important things you guys understand that you need the, every single polynomial once you're given one, you know there's a factor. You can find a factor for that. And then you, if you cannot find more than three. Um, so now there's a couple other tests that I want to talk about. First one is how to determine the number of rational roots. Um, and rational roots are, you know, fractions, one half, three, anything we can write as a rational number. So the rational root test, what that tells us to do is we take the factors of p and divide it by the factors of q. So we just label the constant as p and your leading coefficient um, as q. And if we take the factors of p over the factors of q, that will tell us all the possible, possible rational roots. So the factors of 3 are plus or minus 3 and plus or minus 1. The factors of q are plus or minus 2 and plus or minus 1. Therefore, giving me a total list of factors, I don't know if I have enough room, which would be plus or minus 3 over 2, plus or minus 3, 3 over 1, which is 3, plus or minus 1 over 2, and plus or minus 1 over 1, which would be 1. So therefore, I have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight possible rational factors. Now, do we, do we know that any of them are going to be there? No, we could have all real, um, or I'm sorry, all irrational roots, or we could have all, you know, we could have two complex roots. We don't really know, but if I'm going to ask you, you know, if we have a rational root, we know that these are your only possible rational roots. So what I would probably say, you know, usually what we do is, you know, you can graph it and say, hey, is one of these numbers, you know, when you graph it, you can see, is one of these one of your roots? Is this where the x-axis crosses? 
or your graph crosses the x-axis, then you know it's rational root. Um, the other way you could test this is you could use synthetic division. You know, if I take one of these factors, let's say I do one, and I do two, three, negative eight, and three, and if I get a remainder of zero, then I know one is a zero, right? The same thing, if I did negative one, I could test that, all right? But it'd be a waste of my time to test uh, two to see if that's a root because two is a rational number, but the only possible rational num roots are these uh, eight numbers, all right? So remember, you can use synthetic division to find out if it's a factor or not. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is Descartes' rule of signs. And what Descartes' rule of signs says, if I have my function f of x equals 2x cubed plus x plus 3x squared minus 8x plus 3. What Descartes' rule of signs says, if you take a look at um, the, the signs of each of your terms, every single time you have alternating signs, that's going to tell you, for f of x, that's going to tell you the number of possible real solutions. Again, we're not telling you what the solutions are. We're just telling you what the possible or the number of possible real solutions. So it's kind of like, well, it sort of really helped me out. Well, it kind of is, kind of isn't. If you have a graphic calculator, it's going to be much easier, right? But what this is telling you is you should be looking for, you know, two roots, possible real roots. Or you subtract that it's either two possible real roots or descending by an even number. So it's either two or zero. So there's either, there's two possible real roots or no um, possible, I'm sorry, these are positive. Or no positive real roots. Okay? So there's either two possible positive real roots or no, because you always descend by an even number. Then to find out the negative, all right, you could, you, all you do is you plug in negative x. So you do two of negative x cubed plus three times negative x squared minus eight times negative x plus three. Um, so for here, I'm going to end up getting negative 2x cubed plus 3x plus 8x plus 3. And so now my change of signs is going to be 1. So there's only one uh, possible negative real root. All right, so what that's saying is there's either two possible real roots or none, but we know there's at least one of the my roots is gonna be negative and real, all right? So that's just, you know, very helpful because when I look at, I have three roots, right? I have three, po or three possible factors. One of those factors is gonna, give me a, is gonna give me a negative root. So that's pretty powerful. Now the other two could be the other real roots or they could be um, they could be imaginary we are complex we don't really know that's something you're gonna have to figure out and like I said you can figure that out by using a calculator you can figure that out by using synthetic division I show in other videos how to do that but that's just some really under good stuff you need to know to understand last thing I want to talk about is complex conjugates and if we look at the function x squared plus uh, 2 equals, uh, let's say x plus 2 is my factor, all right? So let's say I have x plus 2 is my factor. Um, I'm going to want to solve, you know, for 0. So, you know, this can subtract by 2. I get x squared equals the square root of negative 2. I can pull out my i. x squared equals square root of 2i. Um, what am I doing? Right? You take the square root, that cancels out. So it's x equals plus or minus square root of two i. And what I'm what I'm trying to tell you is whenever what this is then, so that means x equals plus square root of two i and negative square root of two i. 
So one thing you gotta understand, if I say, hey, there's a zero, and one of your zeros is three i, well, let's, well, let's just say square root of two i. Let's just take the problem. If I just tell you one zero, one thing that your book and we're gonna talk about is complex or complex numbers always, if they're a zero, your their conjugate is always gonna be your zero as well. Therefore, I know that if I have if I give you square root of two plus i is a zero, then you know that negative square root of two i is also a zero. Alright? And so that's just one thing you need to know. If you figure out if you find a zero and one of it's your one of it is a complex number, then you know the conjugate is also gonna be a zero. And you know, one thing that's helpful is you know in a math problem sometimes we do, hey, the zeros are three and you know uh, uh, i. Well, therefore, I know that the real zeros are three i and negative i. Okay, so it's always going to be you need to make sure that you're including your i and your negative i. Square root of two i, negative square root of two i. 3 plus 2i, um, 3 minus 2i. Anything that's, remember, it's always your complex number and its conjugate are always going to be zeros in there. And that's really about an overview of your zeros of polynomials that I want to go over now.